Every three years, dating back more than a half century, the city of New York declares a housing crisis. The New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey determines, among other things, the city's official vacancy rate, or how many housing units are currently available for rent. For apartments priced at $1,500 a month or less, that rate is currently less than 1%, a 30-year low. One third of renters in the city spend more than half their income on rent. The median effective rent in Manhattan is $3,870, a record high. Stories of the absurd lengths people will go to to secure apartments have entertained New Yorkers for decades. But it seems more desperate now than anyone can remember. And for once, the absurd cost of rent isn't just a New York City story. By one company's estimates, Miami became the third most expensive city in which to lease an apartment this year. Median rent in metropolitan Phoenix has hit an all-time high. What can explain these absurd numbers? Will they ever return to normal? And could rent control, which economists have long decried, help people stay in their homes? Or does it just make the expense problem worse? I'm Alex Perrine. And I'm Laura Marsh. This is The Politics of Everything. Would you like to hear more from TNR? Every day, our writers and editors work to bring you the reporting and analysis you need to make sense of the world. But we can't do it without you. Please consider subscribing to The New Republic with our special offer at tnr.com slash special offer. That's tnr.com slash special offer. Bridget Reed is a features writer at New York Magazine and Curbed, who has written multiple articles recently about the state of the New York City housing market. Bridget, thanks for talking to us today. Thanks for having me. So you recently wrote for Curbed about an experience that I very, very gratefully have not had to have in a while, which is looking for an apartment in Brooklyn. How did it go? How is it out there? I do not recommend it <laughs> to anyone. <laughs> So, and why is that? <laughs> yeah. What was what? It's harrowing out there. And I was actually looking in uh, February and March. So that was when there was actually some relief in the market, we now know from some data that's come out recently. And it's gotten actually worse in April and mm. May. So I recommend it even less, I guess. But yeah, I mean, it's, we're just in this crazy housing shortage. When we say crazy, though, what, what's the indicator of crazy? How many apartments are you looking at before you find one that's reasonable? Like, how many times are you, like, making an offer or trying to sign a lease uh, before actually being accepted? Yeah, craziness, I would say a more specific word is the frenzy. A realtor used the word the scrum to me. So it's almost at every single level of the process. So there's when you look at the actual listing on Street Easy or Zillow or whatever, and then you're already told that people are applying without even seeing it. So mm -hmm. then you get to the showing and you've applied already, which is psycho, just to get ahead. So you've paid the $20 application fee, you sent them your tax return and maybe even your parents' tax return. And they know more about you than the government. Mm -hmm. And then then at the showing, you're hearing people offering more money than the listed rent amount. That's crazy. And then depending on if it's a smaller landlord, they might want to know more about you and, and your vibe and you're writing a letter. Jonathan Miller, who's this appraiser that has reams of, of rental and, and um, leasing data, has us at around 2% vacancy rate for for all of Manhattan. And he says he can extrapolate that that's probably the same for Brooklyn. So it's there's... Yeah, there aren't enough apartments. Okay, so 2% seems really low because that means just if there aren't very many apartments actually on the market and there's people looking, it's just really tight. What was normal before the pandemic? Relative to New York City, we've never surpassed 5% in terms of a vacancy rate overall since 1965, which is why we've been in a housing emergency technically since 1965. Mm -hmm. So 2% overall might not seem that much lower than 5%, but it is low. We weren't that low before the pandemic. And I believe, you know, this is very low also nationally. So 2% mm -hmm. even among housing shortages in other cities um, is quite low. Yeah, I mean, it's never been fun to look for an apartment in Brooklyn. And I remember, you know, years ago, you would go and it would be, uh, oh, this is clearly a, a, a windowless, illegally converted basement that you were claiming is like a two-bedroom. Mm -hmm. But then I could be like, I'm going to turn this down because I don't want to live in a windowless basement and I will mm -hmm. be able to find something else. You know, that just gave me a flashback to the absolute worst rental story of my history, which was when I first moved to New York. Someone tried to get me to rent their garage as a bedroom. 
And it was a garage where you could actually flip up the garage door, like, to drive a car in. <laughs> and and I was like, oh, would that open? Like, would that still be sort of openable when I'm in here sleeping? And they were like, yeah, and we also want to store a lot of our kids' stuff in Rubbermaid <laughs> totes in the corner. <laughs> where was this garage? I believe it was in Park Slope. Mm. Mm. a month. That was like 11 years ago. So now you would be writing a letter about how much you love, you can't wait to make the garage (laughs) your home. I've always wanted to live in a garage. I wouldn't have even seen that door. I would have just offered $2,000 a month for it. Sight unseen. I think that's what's remarkable about what's happening right now in New York in particular is New York is a storied place where everyone wants to live. That's been the trope of New York for decades, if not like um, nearly a full century. So New Yorkers already had a higher tolerance for doing whatever it takes to get that apartment. I mean, that's the center of Rosemary's Baby is they take the cursed apartment because it's rent stabilized. And they like look over all this stuff because they're like, whatever, this is a great apartment. Oh, you're so right. So it's been that way for so long. So even for New Yorkers, for whom this is already something where it's so cutthroat, it is just the frenzy, the scrum is beyond sort of everyone's imagination right now. It seems interesting that the sort of classic New York story of fighting for the apartment was formerly limited to quote unquote, you know, more desirable neighborhoods. And it, it really seems like it's just kind of spreading everywhere now in this way that seems really out of control. Yeah. And it's concentrated on the actual lower end and the income scale, which is also making it really frustrating. So the vacancy rate above $2,300 in terms of the rental price is at 12% versus um, I believe it's somewhere around five for under that amount. And then under 1500, there's almost nothing. It's a fraction. It's almost nothing under 1500. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you can see how it's disparate across incomes. You know, there are renters above the income bracket for whom this isn't so competitive. And then there are ones below below, you know, people using vouchers, people in rent-stabilized places, and people in public housing, obviously, who are not participating in bidding wars. So there is a very specific part of the population for whom this crunch is really, really visceral. Yeah, I think it's true. If, if you have a lot of money, you can find somewhere to rent without worrying about it too much. Yeah, we had a, my colleague, Cleo Chang, uh, wrote about a, a recent story that a couple paid $10,000 above the rental amount, sight unseen for a Brooklyn Heights apartment. Yeah, a Brooklyn Heights apartment on like Livingston too, right? Like right, it's like not even, <laughs> sorry, not to be not to be a snob, but that's not even the nice part of Brooklyn Heights. <laughs> oh, that's not where you would personally choose to spend $40,000 a month on rent. <laughs> so you actually, because they've obviously paid a lot above the asking price and you coined the term. I don't. I feel like I should allow you to say it. What is the term? If Brian Lehrer said it yesterday, Alex. <laughs> okay, Brian Lehrer. <laughs> Brian Lehrer said it on the radio. All right. You call it, you call it cuck money. <laughs> tell, us, tell us about what that is as a phenomena. <laughs> so I just want to preface that it first came from key money. We wanted something that sonically resonated with key money, which yeah. is a practice that isn't so much of a big deal anymore because it's it w- refers to money paid under the table to secure a highly coveted rent stabilized or rent controlled apartment that you would pay to a landlord or a broker or even a tenant who was living in the apartment who was leaving that was key money it's illegal but there aren't any rent stabilized yeah, apartments no, yeah. anymore the, the rent so controlled apartment is yeah right. not a quite a right thing. so key money doesn't exist but we wanted something for this money being paid above the asking price because initially when I started reporting this story there was And there still is a lot of confusion about how can this be legal because it doesn't feel like it should be because it feels absurd. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted something to capture the absurdity and frankly, the abject humiliation of rolling up to an apartment and begging to pay more when you're not even owning it. I mean, (laughs) there's, it's just so it's gross and it's vulgar and you feel cucked. And so people, I have had people reach out to me and say, is this legal? And the answer is yes. Where do brokers come into all of this? Because it feels chaotic, Uh. (laughs) but is it like, um, oh, there's no rules, so everything's crazy, and it just happens to be that prices are massively going up, or is this orchestrated in some way? Laura, your question gets into the role of brokers at large, which is a... It's a controversial position because they really are working specifically for the landlord and yet tenants pay a fee. It's becoming more um, controversial, I think, as we speak because of that theatricality and how manipulative I think it it can feel. And Mm -hmm. there it really depends on who you ask, right? Like for, let's say, like 
the yimbies in the room, it's all about build more so that these viewings aren't so scarce. But if you talk to some tenant advocates, they'll be like, well, thousands of units, and we don't even know how many are being warehoused right now to make the environment even more scarce, which is when landlords keep their apartments from going on the market. So the broker is sort of in between middlemanning this process in a way that is definitely contributing to to the frenzied nature because it is a position that requires the scarcity in order to like function best because it's like why do you need a broker to deal with all these crazy people so it's it's yeah i I don't. I don't want to speak ill of them. <laughs> well, no, I, I, you can speak ill of brokers. They're, I mean, I, honestly, they're middlemen and they extract rents. If you've never looked for an apartment in New York City, you might not know this because it's not true almost anywhere else in the country that a prospective tenant pays a broker for showing him an available apartment. And interestingly, those those brokers' fees were very, very temporarily banned during the pandemic, and then that ban was lifted. You know, to get into the politics of this, like brokers are have some pull in the state capital and in the city. But I can't imagine if a politician promised to end brokers fees tomorrow, like, it would be the one of the most popular things any New York politician's ever done. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I'm really baffled by in this moment is we've seen so much fluctuation in the housing market, particularly in New York, right? With the pandemic, rents were went lower for a little while mm-hmm. for this very brief period. And now they're going up. Trying to find an apartment in New York has always been hard, but why is it so much harder right now? What's changed? It dep- who you ask and their agenda is what will determine what they will tell you. Mm-hmm. It definitely in the short term, the rush of people coming back to the city because NYC is back, baby, as our mayor says, <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> contributing to it, right? So Eric Adams' swagger contributed to it is what you're saying? The swag attacks. Right. In 2021, our population started increasing for the first time in several years versus overall net decrease. So more people are coming back. That's happening right now. But talk to people, again, on the housing stock side who really want us to build more. I have a stat from the Furman Center, which is that we built less housing over the 50 years between 1970 and 2020 than we did just from 1920 to 1930 in New York. Mm -hmm. So we built more in that decade than we did in the last 50 years. So there's also a dynamic that's several decades in the making that's coming together as well to produce this crisis. There are a few reasons, I would say. In your story, you also have one reason that is a little bit more (laughs) unconventional. Do you want to tell us about that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I happened to mention in front of a New York Magazine editor that (laughs) A broker had told me that there weren't any one bedrooms, which I was looking for, because everyone had broken up in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so everyone wanted one bedrooms. And that's why I was actually looking for an apartment. So it really resonated with me. So of course, New York Magazine said, you will write about your personal life. We're going to force you to write that. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's the the perfect New York mag anecdote. So you should have known what you were getting into. No, it's truly my fault. (laughs) Yeah. So I had to chase down this theory of whether there was actually a shortage among studios and one bedrooms because there were more single people looking (laughs) around, which which couldn't technically be proven, but I did have, speaking of the Furman Center, Matt, who's one of their researchers, write me last week that the housing vacancy survey that did come out does show a shortage, a very particular shortage in the latter half of the pandemic among one bedrooms and Mm -hmm. studios. And so he was like, you might have been onto something. So I feel really vindicated. I think you're vindicated. The rental market is a hard economic story with, you know, numbers and stats. But a lot of it is just like guesses and vibes. Totally. Like even among the experts. (laughs) Well, I think the other thing it highlights is the reasons people move are intensely personal. It might be that you've broken up with someone. It might be that, you know, several people were able to rent a one bedroom for the first time ever in the the early years of the pandemic because the rents were lower. Mm -hmm. There's so many reasons someone is looking for a particular kind of housing. And in a market like this, that becomes really intensified. And so all of these needs that people have are kind of exaggerated because of scarcity. Totally. Where on the one side you have a landlord for whom it is a profit-making enterprise, right? It's a commercial enterprise. And then on the other hand side, you have a tenant for whom it is their home. Mm-hmm. That, that's such a stark difference. For one person, it really is a, it's a basic need, right? It's shelter. And on the other side, it's someone, you know, it, it's a service that they're providing for a fee. And uh, yeah, now people are understanding like, uh-oh, should this be such a commercial enterprise? <laughs> 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And New York, because, as you say, it's been in a housing emergency for decades, I think can serve as something of a a cautionary tale for the rest of the country, where there are a lot more renters than there used to be, and and where all over the place, rents are all of a sudden rising, much like they are here. For sure. One friend said to me, you know, I'm seeing a lot more housing activists among my, like, you know, friends of mine who would most typically be sort of bougie in their politics, right? Housing is creating some people with um, some pretty uh, pretty left ideas now about who should own housing and, and who should profit from it, you know? How it should be distributed. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. So you did your own personal housing crisis. You did make it through and you did get an apartment. And it, to me, it looks very nice here on this screen. But how is it? Are there any downsides to it? Well, I do look into an interior courtyard directly into another man's apartment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some cabinets are installed backwards, so they open not sort of like a, a cabinet, but more like a... Well, just a backwards cabinet. I can't, I can't describe it any better than that. <laughs> I've had some critters visit me. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, but yeah, I'm I'm cucked. So I didn't pay cuck money, but I feel cucked <laughs> overall in that I'm just like, whatever, man. This is my apartment. This is it, yeah. <laughs> the resignation is, is uh, strong, so. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to us, Bridget. Thanks, guys. The housing crisis we're talking about has been decades in the making, and there is actually a set of policies that could alleviate it. After the break, I'm speaking with Dean Baker, an economist who famously identified the 2000s housing bubble before it burst, about those policy solutions and why economists hate them. This episode is supported by Democracy Decoded, a podcast by the Campaign Legal Center. If you're like me, you're probably a bit frustrated with the state of our political system today. Why does American democracy look the way it does? How can we make it more responsive to the people it was formed to serve? Host Simone Lieber speaks with experts from across the political spectrum and takes a deep dive into the forces fueling our elections, not just in our nation's capital, but at all levels of government. Democracy Decoded takes you on a journey into our campaign finance system, It looks at the effects of secret spending at both the federal and state level. It explores where and how foreign governments are spending to attempt to influence our American elections. And it investigates the fight against the outsized influence wealthy special interests have on local elections. Tune in to learn more about how we can use innovative ideas to build a stronger, more transparent, accountable and inclusive democracy. Find the show at democracydecoded.org or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd like to tell you about a show you might like, 5 to 4. 5 to 4 is a podcast about how much the Supreme Court sucks. As the court marches further and further to the right, it claims it's a completely apolitical institution. That's patently untrue. And 5 to 4 shows you why. Every week, 5 to 4 takes on the Supreme Court's worst decisions about the most important issues, like police abuse, the Second Amendment, and voting rights. Each episode covers a Supreme Court case that reveals the ways in which the justices contort the law, make stupid legal errors, and generally hack away at our democracy. If you are fed up with being gaslit about the court's supposed political neutrality, we think you'll like 5 to 4. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. We're joined now by Dean Baker, Senior Economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Dean, thank you for talking to us today. Thanks a lot for having me on. So we're talking about affordability. I want to talk about a subject that economists love, rent control. It feels to me like for many, many years, the consensus in the economist world was that rent control was a terrible thing. But before we get into that, can you describe, first of all, what rent control does? So rent control is basically preventing rents from rising to the market rate. And there are different rules. So usually there's provisions for rents to rise in step with costs. That's pretty much universal. There may be an exception to that. And there are different rules about things like vacancy decontrol, which means if I'd been in a rent-controlled unit and then I move, the landlord is able to charge the market rent. Some cases they aren't able to charge the market rent, but they give a much larger increase based on decontrol. So in the eyes of the economics profession, what exactly is wrong with that arrangement? 
the issue that most economists would say, we draw a simple supply and demand curve. And Mm -hmm. we go, okay, here's our upward sloping supply curve. Here's our downward sloping demand curve. And we put the price control, the rent control, below where those two cross. I mean, that's the point. We want to have uh, lower rents than what the market would give us. And we see that there'll be more demand than there is supply. And then you go, oh, so we have a shortage. And that's kind of a simple story. I think the basic story is true. I mean, if you you yeah. put the control below the market level, then, yeah, there'll be some of a shortage. But I used to have fun teaching this back years ago when I taught an intro micro class. I'd draw those lines. And then, then I'd go, okay, well, let's change this a little bit. And I'd draw a vertical supply curve. So a vertical supply curve means that no matter how much demand there is, you can't produce more of the good. Or in housing, at least, you can't immediately produce more of the good, no matter how much demand there is. Yeah. And I'd go, okay, let's have rent control in the market. Well, you still have a shortage. You know, you could show that. You still have more people wanting units than units available, but no less people are housed. Mm -hmm. You haven't affected the supply. And those of us who've tried to look at more carefully, you go, okay, the supply curve is not literally vertical, but at a moment in time, it probably is pretty close to vertical. Mm-hmm. So we're not necessarily excluding people from having housing. It might mean different people have housing, but right. what you're in effect doing if you have rent control, and particularly if you give people security of tenure, so I can't throw you out, you're in effect saying, okay, there's been a big increase in housing prices and housing values in this area. And we're not going to let the owner capture all of that benefit. We're going to give some of that to the renter. Right. And you go, what's wrong with that? (laughs) So if we assume a fixed supply of housing, what we're doing with rent control is ensuring that high demand does not force real people out of their homes. And I guess that's what has always struck me about the Econ 101 explanation of what's wrong with rent control. It's always saying, well, it'll drive up prices, but it doesn't drive up prices for the person who currently lives there. One of the conservative publications used to have like all the prominent liberal leftist types who are benefiting from rent control apartments in New York City. And they go, oh, you know, I remember Abby Hoffman was one of them back in the 80s, I think it was. He was living in a really nice place for a very low rent. And you go, okay, so you want to make a big deal about that. Suppose he had owned it, Mm -hmm. you know, suppose it had been a condo and it tripled, quadrupled in value. No one would say anything about Abby Hoffman. Maybe some people would. I think most people (laughs) want, you know, that he made a lot of money. His condo, he got it for $100,000. Now it's worth $800. Well, good for him. You know, that's what most people would say. But if you say, oh, you're living in a rent control place, you're paying, you know, $800 a month on a place that the, in the open market would be 4000 then they go, oh, well, that's a scandal. And you I mean, would, not to say there aren't issues, there are issues, but right. I just don't see that in and of itself as being a huge scandal. Because if he had spent 30 years paying off a fixed rate mortgage, he'd be paying nothing. It'd be, it'd be the exact same situation. Yeah, yeah. So we have this idea, if you own it, then that's fine if you come out really rich. But if you're a renter, you don't have any rights. You don't have the right to gain from you know the fact that you're, you're living in a place. So one of the objections to rent control that I've heard is that developers are just going to stop building apartments because they can't make any money off them if they can't charge whatever the hell they want for it. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. The major sort of comeback, you know, in insofar as you've had cities be responsible in how they regulate rents is they don't have rent control in new construction. Mm-hmm. So what they say is, OK, everything that was built before May 1st, 2022, that's going to be subject to rent control. But you, you want to go and build a new apartment building, whatever, you can charge whatever you feel like. Now, what the conservatives, the opponents of rent control are going to say as well, but they know they can't really trust you because, you know, they'll do that. And then two years from now, you put rent control in their unit. There's not an answer to that. They might be worried about that. But the point is you structure it so that at least in principle, you tell builders that they can go ahead and build new units and they can charge whatever they want. Right. So the the argument would be rent control will distort the market and cause people not to want to build apartments and rent them out. And so then one solution to that is to uh, not subject new units to rent control. It seems like I, 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 you know, I, I personally support rent control just from the perspective of, you know, preventing displacement, allowing people to stay in their homes. But you can see obvious flaws in it. Like as you were just describing, that's a system that protects incumbents and doesn't help future renters. So it seems like 
to get relief, rent relief, more is needed. What actually do we need to do to make housing affordable in American cities? Yeah, I see rent control as the best of temporary measure. And and it's, you know, people pointed this out. It's not necessarily helping the people who you might most want to help, because just as a factual matter, it tends to be the case. Lower income people move more frequently. They mm-hmm. they have less stable jobs. And if you have, you know, they're in a situation where they're trying to look for a rent controlled unit, they're going to have a hard time. And particularly if you have vacancy decontrolled, and by definition, they won't be able to get it. So it's not necessarily helping the people you most want to help. There's also an issue that landlords often in rent controlled units don't do maintenance. One the counterpoint is if you have security of tenure, many tenants do their own maintenance. I know many people yeah. in New York units, rent controlled units, they paint their place. They put in new windows. If yeah. you expect to live there for the next decade, well, you're going to benefit from that. But at the bottom line is you do need more units. And yeah. we've seen limits on housing, not so much. I, I, the, the fear that there'll be rent control, I'm sure, is a factor. But I think that's the much, much less important factor in a place like New York City. I think it's much more zoning that you have a lot mm-hmm. of zoning restrictions that you know people are increasingly paying attention to. I think that's a good thing. I, I don't want to see every neighborhood turned into high rises, but you could have many multifamily units without destroying a neighborhood. At the end of the day, we do need more housing, and zoning has been a obstacle to that most places. There are a lot of places in the country where it's essentially illegal to build apartments, right? Like it's they're zoned for single family housing only and all these things. Why was for so long American policies so geared toward home owning? It's an interesting question. It was very conscious policy uh, after World War II to make the country of nation of homeowners. So mm-hmm. we had uh, GI Bill of Rights, people, veterans, and at that time, basically all men were veterans. So you had the opportunity to get a very low cost uh, loan from the Veterans Administration. We had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that, in effect, subsidized mortgages, uh, knocking off one to two percentage points by, in effect, guaranteeing having the federal government guarantee mortgages. So we really geared our policy in a lot of different ways. Tax deduction uh, for mortgage interest, that too, I should mention. We had a policy that was very much oriented towards promoting home ownership. And on the conservative side, the idea was, oh, homeowners will be conservative. You know, they'll vote yeah. you know, Republican or they'll vote in any case support conservative politicians. And a lot of liberals said, well, it's a good thing. We want people to have property, have a stake. And if the average worker could have a stake, that's a good thing. So it really was largely across the political spectrum. People thought home ownership was a really great thing. Yeah, you can see the logic of it in that sort of post-war, I guess, consensus era that it would create middle class wealth. But it obviously had a lot of unintended consequences. My question is, at that same moment, were other comparable wealthy nations doing the same thing? Were they were they pushing house ownership the same way that we were? You have other countries that have adopted similar policies. I think Ireland has a higher home ownership rate than the U.S. U.K. is very comparable. Other countries had policies that were very much oriented towards supporting renters. So in, in Germany, their home ownership rates somewhere around 50 percent. I couldn't give you the latest number, but, you know, again, considerably less than the U.S. Very wealthy country, obviously. It's not that they're a poor country. Mm-hmm. It's just they made it much more desirable to rent in the sense that you have stability. They have laws that generally make it difficult to throw out a tenant. You have to either show cause. You didn't pay your rent for three months or you've been burning down the house or something, you know, something like that. You have to show cause. <laughs> we aren't the highest in terms of home ownership, but we're, we're near the highest. And you have quite a range with, uh, again, some countries having legislation, having rules that much are much more supportive of renting, and as a result of that, do have much lower home ownership rates. I want to talk about the politics of this for one second, because there are a bunch of cities where I guess these sorts of YIMBY policies are becoming more popular. They're allowing denser development there. Some places are, are in, trying to institute rent control. St. Paul and uh, just instituted rent control, which I grew up around there, and I find that wild. But broadly is the sort of liberal democratic coalition, is there a contradiction between the fact that it contains homeowners who have a self-interest in homes becoming ever more expensive and renters who need to afford rent? 
Well, it certainly can. I mean, the story of home ownership and people protecting what they think they have is often not a pretty one. I mean, a lot of this is racial, you know, because I was yeah. mentioning before how after World War II, we encouraged home ownership. Well, that was largely among the white population. So it was yeah. very difficult for many very comparably situated blacks. So a black who might have had a good job working in the auto industry or something, it'd be much harder for them to be a homeowner than a white working in the auto industry. They couldn't get mortgages from banks. I mean, literally they couldn't, um, that, that's gotten better, but there's still almost certainly some discrimination, but it was just open policy. Many blanks would not lend to black people. I grew up in Chicago and there were neighborhoods literally a black person could not move into. Their house would be firebombed. Their kids would be threatened at school. That was very open. You didn't have to do any looking underneath the surface. It was all totally up front. Yeah. And so, but I, I wonder today, why, for example, do we not see Joe Biden say, I'm going to do something about rent? It still feels like the Democratic Party wants to encourage home ownership, but doesn't have a sort of message for people who are renting. I think it gets, um, you know, this kind of hits at uh, sort of fundamental things. It's might even be worse than saying, hey, we're going to do something on police. Mm -hmm. There's so much of an idea that, hey, home ownership's the American dream. Now, to his credit, he did have in Build Back Better proposals that would give money to, to cities if they had uh, inclusive zoning to uh, promote yeah. multifamily units. And to my view, that was a great thing. So that didn't necessarily mean rentals, but it could mean rentals. He did have that. But I think saying that, you know, oh, we want to make the world better for renters, that that's just seen as like, oh, you're you're saying there is no God. You know, you can't you can't do that. <laughs> no. Right. So home ownership remains like the ideal in American life. And it seems pretty it seems pretty unshakable. You know, I've had a lot of debates on people because I don't think wealth is necessarily a good measure of anything. And this is kind of front and center because for the vast majority of people, most of the wealth they're able to accumulate in their lifetime is their house. And if you go, okay, well, suppose that you had security in your, your rental, your security in yeah. your tenure, that you know you knew the rent wasn't going to go up much, you know, more or less with inflation, but not beyond that, and your landlord couldn't throw you out, then what's the big advantage of home ownership? Yeah. Um, we think of it here like, oh, I want to be able to know that I could live in my place for till I till I die. You know, well, if you had rental uh, regulations that gave people security tenure, then you're able to do that in a rental unit. I worked for a little while with a financial journalist who made a lot more money than I did. And he rented and the entire office made fun of him because he was redoing his kitchen himself in a rental unit. But he had calculated, I can rent, I'll redo my kitchen and all my extra money, I'll just throw in my Vanguard account or whatever. It, it would be, it'll accumulate there instead of having to like accumulate in the value of the property I own. Yeah, well, that could be a very reasonable decision. And, you know, a lot of people have crazy ideas. I remember back during the bubble years, you know, people were saying, oh, you don't have to worry if prices are high because you could always live in your home. And I want to pull out my hair. I had more hair back then. <laughs> you go, OK, sure, you could live in your home. But how many people could afford to live in a home that is worth 200000 that they just paid three hundred fifty for? It literally made no sense. But you had a lot of people, and I don't mean just someone off the street. You had, like, people writing in the business pages of major news outlets saying that, oh, yeah. you could always live in your home. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you think? Do you think that we're just going to see all of these cities, these prices just keep rising and rising and rising? Or do you think that uh, it's going to stabilize at any point in the near future? I, I think we've peaked. I think what you're going to see is a lot of people that might have been getting a bigger house, a lot of people that might have been moving out from their parents or maybe they have a roommate. They are not going to do that. So I, what that's going to mean is freeing up housing, that you'll have mm. housing, you know, in effect, say someone you would have otherwise taken up five rooms, they're taking up three rooms. So that will put some downward pressure on the rental market. None of this is overnight. We'll probably see more of a downward movement in house sale prices than rents for the same reason uh, that we saw more of an increase in house sale prices than rents. They're more volatile. But I think we will see some downward movement in rents. Now, one of the things that I would love to see, and the Biden administration has, um, for whatever reason, not moved on, I could give some possible reasons, but I'd like to see efforts to convert a lot of the vacant office space yeah. to housing units. And to my mind, that's just an incredible way. So you have a lot of these office buildings, New York City first and foremost, but a lot of these office buildings are 30, 40% occupied. People are not coming back. Why have these places sit empty when many could be residential? 
thank you very much for talking to us, Dean. Thanks a lot for the interview, and I enjoyed it. The Politics of Everything is co-produced by TalkHouse. Emily Cook is our executive producer. Myron Kaplan is our audio editor. If you enjoyed The Politics of Everything and you want to support the show, one thing you can do is share this episode with a friend. Thanks for listening.